When I open my eyes every morning, I wake up in a false reality, a galactic dream where I'm the biggest star. This universe is active because I activate it with true intention. I activate it with the earnest belief that I'm the master of my own destiny. As a human being, the question is whether you wake up in a false reality or whether you stay sleeping on yourself. Again, the question is whether you wake up in a false reality or whether you stay sleeping on yourself. How do you know if you're woke? When you are living your dream because that's what life is about. Everyone dreams of being free, but for some reason, some people's search is akin to, to buying a daily lottery ticket. A short and unlikely journey with no obstacles and unrealistic goals. The synchronism found in dreaming and hard work is the key to freedom. Manumission in a day and age where we are deemed legally free, but living within the confines of a double consciousness. Living with the intersectionality of race versus self-image in a place that wasn't made for us and with music in an industry that wasn't economically made for us. But like the lottery ticket holder, we need to set unrealistic goals, but unrealistic goals that are founded upon a kinetic energy that can only be found within, a chi that emanates from self-determination and struggle. This is called confidence, but confidence comes from failure, which actually comes from dreams where you believe you could accomplish the impossible, knowing the impossible is possible, or is it? Well, it is when you activate your life with true intention, when you wake up in a false reality that you created, one that you uniquely molded for yourself. This isn't arrogance, this is confidence in the realm of incantation or the use of your own magic in order to change your own destiny. You are a powder keg as long as you believe you can blow up. But how can you blow up if you don't see it? How can you hear me if you wake up with a dissonant voice telling you that your reality is only what you see in front of you. That your reality is your past, coupled with the fact that your color denies your luminescence or the ability to be the brightest star. It's difficult, but feasibility is found when you realize that everyone has magic. That you are the best version of yourself as long as you work on being the best version of yourself. You can actually trick yourself into waking up in a false reality by learning about others that have successfully transitioned to the other side. And no, I'm not talking about death. I'm talking about life. Life in a false reality where the lucid dream is as real as my voice is right now. As real as this message is as I recite it in front of two people that made me believe in magic. I'm talking about a duo that found the deeper truth by taking risks in order to bypass inequity. Revolutionaries that redefine the value and importance of the black voice at a time when our sonic vernacular was damn near codified as merely being urban. To many, their real gestation period is from 83 to, to 93, a time when they effectively cemented their range and signature in pop music. Nevertheless, Within a span of four decades, they made sounding black sound perfect. We just got used to it. This journey commenced at a time where the black voice was rarely, rarely considered pop. A time during the first half of the 80s where only three black artists had number one albums. Michael, Prince, and Lionel. From the SOS band to Shirelles to Janet to Michael, New Edition, Usher, Mary J., we felt and witnessed from afar their innocent climb to stardom, their rise to black nobility, the string of number one hits and albums that changed the industry and posterity for the black artist. I'm talking about the icons, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. It's flight time, let's go. What's up, y'all? Thank you and good night. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> Can't do Can't no more. Can't do no more. Can't possibly live up to that. Man, it's an honor. It's an honor to speak with you fellas. It's an honor to have been raised by watching your dreams come true. And making me believe that I can actually be a star. Like you've you you two have changed so many people's lives, so many people that you've met, and so many people that you'll never see. And we appreciate you both for all that you have done creatively, but also all you have done as far as making people see the light. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank brother. you for. Oh. I, I felt like I was in, I felt like I was in the twilight zone for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, um, but but I have to tell you something like What's up, bro? Where we are where we are is was never my dream. Yeah. Talk to me. It bro. was my passion. Mm. It was my passion. It was just I I I love what I do and I love who I do it with. Mm -hmm. And so the goals that we achieve were just based on loving the music loving creating the music, loving the artists that we work with, and loving our people and wanting to provide them sometimes with what they needed more than what they wanted. Just mm. in all a health we call it the healthy alternative. I totally you know? get it. I totally get it. So so you know it was it, it was never about me personally. I'm speaking for myself. Mm. So mm -hmm. um it was it was it was never a dream that I'd be famous because I don't long for that. That's not <laughs> I, I like the work more than I like any of the other parts of it. And right. certainly you, you love being celebrated and honored and it's always an honor, you know, yes, but yes. that's not, that's not, but you don't do things in your passion to win awards. You do them because Absolutely. you love them. Absolutely. I always say that if somebody comes up to me and says, yo, Adrian, I love your music. I'm thankful because they're being nice, but nothing makes me feel better than hearing that I inspired somebody's life, you know, and it's, and it's through the passion. And, and when I refer to you guys living your dreams, my thing is that, especially in the era that you guys came up in, it is like a dream to create on that level. I'm not talking about the fame. The fame ain't like, that's, that's ancillary to all this. That's just a byproduct. To me, when I talk about the dream, is you two meeting in Minneapolis. You two being brothers that have worked together for so long and changed other people's lives, changing your own lives, changing the fortunes of your family, and continuing to still be relevant to this day. Um, if that ain't no dream, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it's not about the fame, man. It's about being able to do what you want to do as 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 black men. It's not easy, and y'all persevered at doing that. You know, still a work in progress, brother. Yes, absolutely. You're all, you're continually sharpening your sword. So my thing is, at this point of your career. How much higher can the ceiling go for you? <laughs> well, I think I, I, I think there isn't really a ceiling. Yeah. Um, we, we, we try to raise the bar. Yeah. Something you said, something you said earlier, I think applies to where we're at in our careers right now. Uh, and that is we have a lot, we don't have anything to prove, mm -hmm. but we have a lot to say. Mm. And we now have uh, we now have the knowledge of how to go about saying it, I think, in a better way than we could have 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when we talk about, you know, even the fact that we're finally you know, doing our own album. But I, don't, I think it would have been a different album 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I think the album we're doing now is the album that, that should be done because now we know enough so we can do enough. Wow. And, and, I, and I think the, the, the other kind of philosophy that kind of goes with sort of the idea of, of longevity was that, um, and I'm always reminded of this, 
when we when the control album came out 35 years ago this year i remember the very first uh, interview we did was kind of the local hometown uh, paper the minneapolis paper mm -hmm. uh, it was a guy named john breen was the was the interviewer and the first he started the interview by saying you guys are the hottest producers how does that feel to be the hottest producers and we said to him well, we don't really want to be the hottest producers. We want to just be warm for a long time. <laughs> and wow. he kind of he kind of laughed at that. And so then I remember, you know, five years ago, I think it was when we released uh, the Unbreakable album with Janet, mm -hmm. and the record opened at number one, and I think the single was number one for twelve weeks or something. And he started off the interview by, and he's still at the paper. He's still at the same paper. Great. He set, starts the interview off and he says, you guys realize you've had number one records for four decades, mm. 80s, 90s, 2000s, mm. 2010s. Mm. How does that feel? Mm. And we said, um, well, remember what we said to you when you interviewed us oh, you know, 35, no. 30 years ago, <laughs> warm for a long time. Wow. And he just laughed. Wow. So I, Although, so, so as, as Terry was saying, you know, it's not really a dream necessarily, but it was an intent that the choices we made and the artists we worked with and the, and the decision to, at a certain point of our careers, almost not abandon music, but just kind of put it in the background so we could raise our kids, so we could, you know, have successful marriages, so on and so forth. The other things that were important in life now has allowed us to kind of persevere this far and have the longevity, if you will, um, even the choices to not make everybody sound the same, to give everybody mm. their own sound, right? Rather than one sound. All of those kinds of things were all based on being warm for a long time. So I think that was that was the intent. So that's what we tried to do. So I just want to go back before to and, and come to this point where you guys are releasing this... It's weird. It's like your 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 group solo out. It's just so it's so it's so weird. It's not weird, not weird because it doesn't make sense. It's just that you guys have done so much in forty years for so many people, and you're finally now making your <laughs> debut album in a way, which is but we'll it's our debut yeah, album. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. I just want people to understand the journey a little bit. I want to let's go back to to around 82 when you guys came out to LA and did the happy you had the happy hopes track and i believe Clarence Avant heard that right if, if i'm not mistaken he heard that and said i need it was he, is he the one who said that that was needed for SOS band well high hopes was the song i mean high hopes, actually yeah. high hopes yeah. high hopes, high hopes yeah. yes yeah. Yeah. yeah but high hopes what happened with high hopes was we had met um, actually at a celebrity basketball game because Terry played. I sort of played. I acted like I played, but I didn't mm -hmm. really play. But we, but Leon Silvers. It was the Silvers versus. Um, it was K Day or one of the mm -hmm. radio stations mm -hmm. in LA, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And anyway, so after that, we got together, uh, and we were big Leon Silvers fans. So we got together, and he was fans of the time. So we mm -hmm. got together. We all went to this studio and hung out. John McClain was there, who A and R, uh, you know, right. the Control album, a bunch of people, yeah. and we just kind of hung out. And so, you know, Leon said, hey, man, you guys got any songs? And we were like, yeah, we got songs and we've had a demo tape, right? And so we gave Leon the demo tape and on the demo tape was High Hopes. That was one of the songs on, on that. So he said, I want to produce that on SOS Band. Mm. And in our minds, we were thinking, well, why, how are you going to do that? Because they got a female singer. But, well, you're Leon Silver, so I know you'll figure right, it out. Right. So when, so when High Hopes actually came out, it was back in that day what was called a turntable hit, meaning the radio loved it and played it to death but nobody really bought the record, right? Mm. So um, when we finally met Clarence a year after that, because we hadn't met him at that point, mm. or actually we did, actually we did, actually we did meet him, we did meet him. And he said that summer, he, he said, man, that High Hopes, man, what was up with that High Hopes record? <laughs> and we said, Clarence, we said that record was, we didn't produce that record, you know, Leon, we wrote it, but we didn't produce it. Right. But then Terry said, well, I got the, I got the cassette of, the, here's the demo of the song, the way we did it. And so when we played him the demo, Clarence loved the demo. He said, oh, man, I, I like this. I like this. What is this on, this on this record? And Terry said, oh, yeah, this version got the chili sauce on it. He said, oh, the chili sauce. <laughs> I like that. The chili sauce. Okay. Well, I put, it, I put it to you like this. I'm waiting for this dude to call me back. And if he doesn't call me back, you know, you guys are going to do the SOS band record. 
And we were like, cool. So the dude never called back, whoever it was. Mm -hmm. And we ended up doing the record. But High Hopes was the one that broke us through the door. And Clarence was the one that, you know, got us, Clarence to recognize that we are, are he called us the two thugs <laughs> you're right. from Minneapolis. So he said, you two thugs, you two thugs know what you're doing. Okay, so I'm going to put you in the studio. So That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. And it's, yeah. it's funny. I actually, I, I have that song on 45 too. And when you listen to it, it's, it's such an aha moment because you guys have such a signature uh, in, in how you write. Um, something that I love about how you guys write is that you'll have these bare chords and then you do something that I call bringing in the sunlight. You'll wait for that moment to bring in that major seven, that minor seven, those little things that's just like, oh, damn, this feels so good. And it's a signature. You guys always, I always hear you kind of just start off with them drums, get the listener used to that. Then you bring in the keys and like that nasty bass and, oh, it just, yeah, you get, you get my point. <laughs> But you know, go, mm -hmm. going back to I'm glad you're here. Yeah, going back to the beginning though, I always say it, it takes more sensibility than ability to to create iconic art. And sensibility is not only knowing what's dope, but what's dope in the moment. And when I think of something like Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing released in 82, it was it was a bounce back for him, you know, for his career, what he was going through with Motel and everything. Um, it wasn't just a good song, it was the time that it came out. And with you guys, you guys had something nascent. It was something different, something that, something unique that was brand new. To me, that's why that track was a turntable hit. Because Cass wasn't ready for where y'all was going. And yes, you guys didn't produce it, so it didn't have that Minneapolis filth that you guys are so uh, known for. But my I thing like is, filth. yes, my thing is, how did you develop the sensibility or understanding that electronic instruments would open up a new sound for Black America in the early 80s? Oh, man, I think we were just dealing with the cars we were dealt. Like, we grew up in an era where technology was not a part of it. Right. Like, you, we grew up in an era that was very, or was totally collaborative. Mm. If, I wanted to re if I wanted to record a song, I needed a drummer. Mm-hmm. I needed a keyboard player, I needed mm -hmm. a guitarist, I needed a vocalist, mm -hmm. and I'm the bassist, and we're all going to go in the studio to, together and create this piece of music, mm -hmm. okay, or this body of work. Mm -hmm. As time came, probably as I started getting into music, synthesizers came along, mm -hmm. and, they, and they started al allowing us to emulate organs in the Farfisa organ, right. and then synthesizers would make sounds. I remember one of the guys uh, that we used to go watch gig, he had the synthesizer and he just played noises on it. Wink, 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 wink. That was probably that the genesis of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we would hear that. And then you hear uh, Herbie Hancock doing all this right. electronica music and you hear different things. So we got into a lot of different things just from that because it was not always available to us. So there was a, a degree of mystery about it, but we were never, we were always inspired by it. We were never afraid of it. So we would always embrace whatever came about. And then they made it happen where you could play drums. You didn't have to have a drummer anymore. Mm. Oh, so I could be the drummer. <laughs> and if I could play keys, I could, you know, if you could play keys, you could play keys on the bass, <laughs> you know, bass on the keys, and then you could play the keyboards. And they got guitar sounds too. And right. after a while, man, it, it's a one man band. Right. But one thing that we we never became was a one man band. Right. It was always two of us with two different concepts and two different ideas. Right. I am the guy that I love. I love the funk. I am the funk guy. Jam is the pretty guy. He loves mm. the the singing groups, the chords, the the major sevenths. That's his thing. Mm. He loves that. He, He's going to make you feel like, ah. Yeah, the so, uh, He's a summer. Yes, right. Right. No. So uh, I want the rub. I want uh, I want it to be a little bit gritty. Right. And so as, as songwriters in the beginning, it didn't work for us because we didn't know enough to figure out how to mer merge those two things into a feeling. But as time went on and we became part of the time, 
it kind of, we got to work together more and more and more and more. And one thing that Prince used to always say is choices. You start to understand how to make better choices, mm. when to, when not to. Cause, cause you know, the ebb and flow of music is push and pull. Right. Pinch and release. You know, yeah, exactly. You gotta, you gotta let it happen. Mm -hmm. And so we learned that and, you know, that morphed into once again, the opportunity with the uh, high hopes morphed us into the opportunity with just be good to me, which became that first hit song for us right. that had all those elements put together in one place. Something that I don't hear people talking about enough for you guys is like I said, you are, you are part of the embryonic sound of black electronic music. And the reason why I bring up sexual healing is because there is this new kind of R&B that used the drum machine as the bedrock of its composition. It, so that 82 is uh, sexual healing. In 83, we got a few joints. We have In Between the Sheets, Isley, Isley Brothers. We also have Tell Me, right? And all this kind of music is a type of music that was never done before it was a brand new sound or let me rephrase it was actually there was drum machine black drum machine music being made before but it wasn't accepted to this degree i'll give perfect example y'all know the uh the timmy thomas track the why can't uh, of course yeah okay so we live together yeah yeah we live together so my thing is when we go back and 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 listen to a song like that most people don't realize that drum machines initially, like with the world is their sideman and all that, it was made to accompany an organ. It was made for you to practice. It was made for you to write. It wasn't made for you to make a, a, a pop hit, a track. So it's crazy because his song came out in 72 and the reviews, he was killed on the reviews. You know, they said it, it, it's, there, there's one from, from Keith Hunt where on the Thanet Times where he talks about the metronome-like backing, taping away track after track gets monotonous. You know what I'm saying? Like they listened to, they heard a drum machine at that time as something that was just monotonous. Rolling Stone said it's 30 minutes of listening to a hack organist and a metronome playing basically the same song. So 10 years prior to 82, this is how it's looking as far as black music. Sexual healing comes along. Y'all come along and y'all literally start to change the sound, right? So then for me as a young man, I'm, I'm 43 right now, but I grew up with y'all music. You know, like I, I remember, I remember the first time I heard Janet Jackson on the radio and it wasn't her first two albums. I remember distinctly being in a car in New York and uh, it, it was uh, What Have You Done For Me Lately coming on. And then the next day I heard Nasty, Control, all that stuff. And I was tripping because my crush, who was Penny, who was Charlene on Different Strokes, now had this new attitude. And it goes back to what you guys were saying as being producers and, putting, or, and, and helping people to become who they're supposed to be. Can, can you talk to me about your knack for using electronic instruments to help people find themselves at the dawn of this black electronic music? Well, I think we, we always were into using the tools that were available. Mm. I think people, uh, I think we are in a way we were traditionalists in the sense of the art of songwriting. We still thought that melodies, chord changes, dynamics, modulations, um, those things were still really important. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that we ever felt like, uh, you know, using a drum machine or using a synthesizer was uh, cheating in any way or, or not being musical. It was about making those things be musical and, and using them to move people. And even in using the drum machine, we would always do what we called the pings and zings track. And the pings and zings track for us was always the natural acoustic percussion, whether it was bell tree mm, right. or wind chimes mm -hmm. or kabasa or um, a vibra slap mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. We would always put those elements into even something that was a drum machine. And, and as Terry would tell you on Tell Me If You Still Care, 
that was an idea where the drum machine, we played the drum machine. Like we put a, there was a pattern in the drum machine but the booms of the 808, mm. of the decay of the 808, or the fact that the claps was basically going, switching the switch between the claps and the maracas, I think is what it was called, or the kavasa, or yeah. whatever it's called. Yeah, the switch. Switching them back and forth. The 808, yeah. yes, yes. So that was all happening in real time going to tape. That mm. wasn't like preconceived, like, oh, we're going to do four bars here and whatever. It was literally as it's going down, we're playing the drum machine. We're turning the day caves were doing the switching of the stuff so there was always a live feel even in the drum machine stuff that we were doing but that came from us being live musicians and playing in bands for so long Mm -hmm. that we always wanted to bring that element to something even that was like that um we never were afraid of the technology we always embraced it we never used it as a crutch Mm -hmm. we didn't think we always used it to try to enhance what we were doing and i remember like even back in the day when like you know this is a little little past that but i remember when sampling came out and everybody would ask us man what do you think about sampling and in their minds they would always know what they anticipated we were going to say mm-hmm. was that oh that's cheating and that's not real musicianship and whatever mm-hmm. and we'd say the exact opposite we'd go we love sampling because mm-hmm. what it does is it allows music to bridge generations Absolutely. where you hear an old song that you love attached to a new song as the foundation of a new song i said what could that's better you know and then people would always go well beethoven wouldn't something and something they always go would go back to that and we'd be like oh yes he would because back in that day that's why you had harpsichords and celestes and all these different things because people were trying to take the instruments and make them sound different in some way absolutely Um, so to me it's just a toolbox that you have if Beethoven was alive today, he'd have the biggest, been back in the, you know, the 2600 ARP days, he'd have the biggest <laughs> setup you could possibly have yeah. because people that are creative, that's what you have to do. You have to embrace uh, the technology. Um, so that's what we always tried to do, but we always tried to do it in the framework of the basics of songwriter, catching catchy melody, catchy lyrics, those types of things, but do it through the artist's eyes, do it through what they wanted to do. Because we always felt like for us, when the song's done, we're done with it. We leave it. Right. The artist is just beginning with it. So mm. it better say what they want to mm. say. And if it's a hit, if it's hit record, they're going to be singing it the rest of their lives. Mm. So please, yeah. so let's not give them something mm. that they don't like. It's interesting because I always say that hip hop serves as a conduit to the past because especially for black culture, it's the Brie College of vinyl. You know, it's 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 us putting all these sounds together to make something new and connecting us, like I said, with our with with, with, with what came before us. And for for you guys, uh, there's a song "No One's Gonna Love You" that was sampled by you know Aesop Rocky. I mean, you guys have been sampled all over the place. I mean, think about Kendrick with uh, uh, "Anytime," you know, all that stuff. So younger generations, like, wait, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And this and that, but. Going back to you guys expanding the sound of black music outside of sampling, because y'all was sampling too. And I always say, as as a multi instrumentalist, as as a as a real purist myself, when cats sleep on sampling, they don't realize that sampling is just as much as an instrument as an instrument is, you know. And and you're working within the lim- limitation of the sampler, and it's not an easy thing to do. So, you know, with you guys, with the song, no one's gonna love you. I love that song. And I remember when I heard that, I was like, yo, this sounds very familiar <laughs> to, I know y'all know what I'm thinking, to uh, Loose Ends. Uh, oh, Hanging on a String? Hanging on a String. And then, yeah, except no one's going to love you came first. Exactly. Yeah. But the same, do, 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 do. But, that, but people yeah. weren't using the 808 like that. And, and, and what's crazy with you guys Again, with changing the sound of, of black music, you weren't only looking at the 808. It's funny, you guys is like, kind of like Bowie. When he would make new albums, a lot of times he would use new musicians because new musicians for him gave him a new sound. Um, like when he brought in Luther to sing on, you know. So with Sherelle, y'all was using the, 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 the DMX, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Y'all was heavy Oberheim at that time. And then, with SOS band, you guys were 808. Now with Janet, you're going Lindrums and y'all changing out sound, you know, sounds and everything just to create something new. 
you guys are using the Mirage also, if I'm not mistaken. And, and that has a sampler right. on it. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But I, I think my question for you as, you know, as, as, a, as a musician, how did you feel at that time using DX7 electric piano sounds versus just using Fender Rhodes? How did, what, what, how did it feel for you at that time? Did it feel new or did it feel like a cheat? Like what, what was this, the feeling for y'all? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, keyboard wise, and, and you know, you're correct in assessing that literally for each artist we did, we tried to bring in new sounds and new keyboards and new drum machines and that, so that everybody once again would have their same sound yes. or, or have their own sound rather. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, just, it's the same tailors sewing the thread, but the materials are different and the right. lapels are different and the, right. So, I mean, the things, that's what we tried to always do. Um, but yeah, I, I like the DX7 because I liked anything that, for me, as a keyboard player, the thing that always inspired me was if I heard a sound, because I'm playing the chords that I kind of like, that I know. Mm -hmm. But when I hear those chords played with a sound that's different, that's inspiring, then to me, that's always the inspiration. I used to tell, I used to drive like keyboard magazine and places like that. I used to drive them crazy because they'd say, you know, what do you think about this synthesizer or this keyboard? And I'd go, eh, that's okay. And they'd go, yeah, but when you get in and really start tweaking the sounds. And I said, I don't really want to tweak the sounds. Mm. Um, I just want to, I, you know what? You pay people to come up with great presets on stuff. <laughs> so... If I'm going through the presets and I don't hear stuff I like, that I'm out. It's like, no. I mean, because you're paying people to do that. So it's like, come up with some great presets. There might be as one preset, uh, the one I always think of, sorry not to get off track, but the one I always think of is there was a, a keyboard called an S3. Mm -hmm. And it was, called, it was a company called General Music, right? Mm -hmm. It had probably two or three good sounds in it, in the whole keyboard mm -hmm. out of all of their hundreds and hundreds of sounds. Mm -hmm. But one of those sounds was the on um, "That's the Way Love Goes," Janet. The, mm. What sounds like a guitar? Mm. Bing, 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 bing. No, mm. it's a keyboard. It's that keyboard. That was the one good wow. sound that keyboard had, and I was like, "Okay, I'm going to use it for this." And so, and I did. That's crazy. But, yeah, I so, always I mean, thought. I, I'm sorry to stop you, but I always thought yeah. that that was uh, the same sample that EPMD used. On. No, it's, wow. it's from a keyboard. Yeah, you blowing yeah, my yeah, mind, bro. About. You are blowing my mind. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, well, that, you know, that's and by the way, crazy. I'll, and, by, and by the way, I'll just I'll just say this: whenever we played a lot of songs that you probably think are guitar or think are bass are keyboards, right? But Terry was always my um, like if I played a part on a guitar, mm -hmm. like. Um, uh, what's a what's a song that I can think of? Anytime, any place. Since mm -hmm. we mentioned it uh, earlier with Kendrick uh, and Drake, so um, there's no guitar on that song, mm. but it sounds like there is. It sounds like guitar on the song, but that's me playing it on a keyboard. But what Terry would always say to me, he would say to me, if I played something that had a guitar sound, he would say, "Yeah, but a guitar player wouldn't play it like that." And I'd go, "Oh, okay." So he always kept me honest, right? Like. Even if we didn't bring a guitar player in, he'd be like, no, guitar player wouldn't play it like that. Or a bass player wouldn't play it like that. Or he yeah. wouldn't play it in that key. Or that kind of thing. So anytime, any place was kind of, for us, in my mind anyway, a virtual band of people. A guy playing a Rhodes piano. A guy playing a bass. A guy playing a guitar. So on and so forth. And you tried to go out of yourself and just try to think about how those musicians would all interact with each other. So we did a lot of that, a lot of that kind of thinking in, in putting tracks together. So I'm a, I'm a super analog dude. Like my entire studio is full analog. I, I record 216 track and mix down to, to quarter inch um, Ampex 350. I was tripping on the fact that y'all did control on an Atari 24 track, Harrison console, because I always look at the Atari as the Honda. Right. I look at the Studers as like the Mercedes of the Beamers. I always saw the Atari as the Honda, but the Atari is such a good instrument. And it's crazy that y'all record at plus six as well, you know. So but these are all the things that it, that is just 
so you and your sound. And also, it's crazy that when y'all was recording this Control album, you guys did that in Minneapolis. And it just kind of, it, it, it shows people that you can be at the top recording on your own terms. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause y'all just, you know, y'all what spent like six weeks with her, right? Chill with her for a little bit. Yeah. Record all, you know, yeah. mm, it's, it's, it's insane. Well, man. by the way, it's really funny too, because when we did, I have to, and I have to give credit to, uh, to, to Sherelle. And yeah. the reason I've given her credit is we had set up our own studio. And by the way, we, now I'll go back. We discovered Otari machines because we had seen students and all the, all the recording studios we had been in, it was Studer machines. It was SSL consoles mm -hmm. um, or, or Neve mm -hmm. in every studio, occasionally API in some studios, but that's what was there. Right. And um, we went over to Italy to do change, to do the change album. Oh, wow. And the studio in Italy that we were at, it was actually in a villa in the house. And uh, they had an Otari machine. And that was the first time we'd seen an Otari machine. Mm. So when we were coming back to Minneapolis to set up our own studio, we got um, SSL boards were coming out of London, right? And they were hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, Harrison's were made in Nashville. So we're like, okay, how much mm. are these boards? And they were, I don't know, 30 grand, 50 grand, whatever. It's like, okay, yeah. so budget wise, okay, cool. Well, yeah. Let's go with the Harrison, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Otari machines were, I didn't know, 20 grand at the time, as opposed to a hundred grand for the Studers. So right. once again, it's like, okay, well, the Otari seems to work fine. Yeah. And interestingly enough, Otari was innovative enough that when later on, because of tape hiss, when Dolby SR came in, Dolby SR was actually in integrated into the MTR 100 machines. Oh, wow. And, and they were self-calibrating machines, right? So you didn't have to have the tech guy come in and calibrate each track. Mm. You just would put the tape on, whether it was Scotch, whether it was Ampex, whether it was Agfa, it was what we used back in the day. You put the tape on, you just hit play, the machine would align itself, do all the, everything it needed to do, and then you'd be ready to record. And we also recorded a lot of that early stuff, not control, but a lot of the other stuff we recorded in at 15 ips rather than 30. Wow. which gave us a much punchier base. Wow. And, and the plus six on the machine, when we recorded control, we engineered that ourselves. But, but Sherelle was kind of the guinea pig because we had an engineer walk out on us right before that. So yeah. Sherelle, as we're doing, you know, Saturday Love and doing all those songs, we're like plugging in headphones and blowing stuff up. And like, you're trying to, cause this is the patch bay days, right? right, right? right. And, and we're crazy, we, but we're learning on the job. We're just kind of doing it. So she was kind of the guinea pig for that. And she'd go, that's all right, that's all right. So anyway, when we came in to do control, we recorded it ourselves. And one of the things Prince did, Prince always recorded whenever we were in the studio with him, he was always slamming the needles on the, on the analog machine, right? Yeah. So we were like, okay, yeah, we're going to do that when we record. So when we started recording Control, we're on our machine and we're blasting the needles and stuff. So Steve Hodge, we had come and mix the record. Terry said, I'm going to have Steve come and mix us. Steve comes to Minneapolis. He puts on the first song. He goes, who recorded this? <laughs> and we did. We were yeah. all proud. We're yeah, like, yeah. oh, we did. Yeah, 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 we did that. We did it. He said, uh, it's way too loud. <laughs> And we said, oh, oh that, no, that's the way Prince records. You know, yeah. he, he does everything. So it's, you know, it's pinning in the red. Right. And he said, yeah. He said, but Prince's machine is probably set up where zero means zero. Your machine is set up where zero <laughs> means plus six, which means if you're pinning it. Yeah, you're right. And we were like, oh, man. He's, he's, we said, can, <laughs> can, can you save it? And he yeah. said, no, 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 it'll be, it'll be fine. He said, but I, I want to come up and teach you guys how to record. You know, wow. and, and so we ended up, so we ended up hiring him. I think we did human league after that. So we, he did the human league. Album. But anyway, that's kind of the story of all of those kind of things that you mentioned. It was all kind of trial by error, or happy accidents or whatever analogy you want to use. But the way, you know, Prince's theory, by the way, was that when you record things loudly, um, your ears perceive the distortion as being loud, of being playing loud. Yeah. And he said, so he always want that little edge of distortion on things. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to control and all of a sudden, I remember when people would hear control and uh, they'd hear just the first, uh, ta -da, doom, ta -da, yeah. the way the drum sounded. Right. That was because we put it way, way too loud on the tape. 
But the Agfa tape was always really good. You could slam the heck out of it. Mm-hmm. It shed, it shed, which yeah. wasn't good. Yeah. But but you could slam it, and that was part of our sound. And then of course Steve Hodge saving it was right. the other piece of well, that it's that puzzle. that that pleasant harmonic distortion that you get at the top. And plus, I mean, it is compression when you're recording that hard in the red too, so it auto- automatically yep. makes it louder anyway. So um, yep. so I want to ask you this. Can you guys talk to me about the history or the the, ram, the 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 ramifications of classifying black music as urban versus pop? And did any of these classifications serve as a disservice towards the marketing and dissemination of your products throughout the years? That's a good question. I, you know, I don't think we ever took it. Because I don't think we ever took it as anything because I don't think we really classify music. We're black, so we make black music. Uh, so. I mean, we know that. I'm talking about how they're, because right. your music is classified by radio, by your label, and there's different budgets generally attached to this kind of stuff. So Right, right. But yeah. but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is kind of stupid too. We're black, so we make black music. No, we just make music is my point. <laughs> is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we grew up in a, uh, an environment where we listened to and appreciated all styles of music, whether it be mm-hmm. R and B, rock, pop, uh, polkas. We had to learn a little bit of everything mm-hmm. just to even survive in the environment that we grew up in. You know, you might be playing at a ski resort, and somebody comes in and say, "Man, you know the beer belly polka? <laughs> well, you better know. You better know how to strum it up. <laughs> right, or right, you right. do. You, do you know some country? Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. We have to. What key we gonna do this in? Let's hit it because we knew. We know how to hit the progressions. We didn't necessarily know the songs, mm. but it, all you had to do was kind of emulate the feeling of it. And then with the people, you know, after they drink a couple drinks here, we used to say, the more you drink, the better we sound. Um, mm. <laughs> you know, we, we could kind of get through it all, but that's part of why we're very eclectic in our music making. And so number one, for me, I never allow anyone to classify what I do. Mm. Because because if they do that, in my mind, they will relegate me to whatever they want me to be. Mm. And it's like it's like the word potential. When somebody said, man, you got potential. Well, that's your take on my ability, but you have no idea what I can do and what I can't do. Mm. I I have to realize the best of me has nothing to do with what you think about the best of me and, or where you think I will end up. Or, or even where I think, because I'm always just trying to strive for excellence, no matter what it is. So that's just my take on it. So one thing that we've, uh, I guess, as Minneapolis guys, because Prince was the same way, we didn't allow people to define us or what our music was. We just make music and those who accept it, accept it. You know, I do. I do, I do think I will say, Adrian, though, I do think that. Um, as far as the acceptance of what we're doing, uh, what we were doing, I think that, yes, if you, in, in the marketing side of things, in the budgetary side of things, that the word black could have been looked at as confining as far as budgets. Yeah. So putting the word urban attached to it took maybe some of the threat or the perceived threat away from it, if that's what you're asking. But right. once again, that's more on the marketing side of things, which we weren't really all that concerned with. We were more concerned with, you know, making the best music we could. And then the, and let the labels and the marketing people figure out, you know, what you're going to call it. Um, you know, Janet was interesting because pop radio at that time, a lot of the, um, first of all, the, the records that were crossing over mm-hmm. back in that day, mm-hmm were very soft. Like if you were Lionel Richie or you were Luther Vandross or you were, uh, you know, certain artists, the black artists that were looked at as non-threatening, yeah. um, you could have it shot at, at crossing over. But what happened was it made pop radio very soft because then you started having, you know, the rock bands making ballads. Mm. And all of a sudden, if you listen to pop radio at that point in time, it was a very down tempo, right? When the rock bands were coming out with ballads. Right. And the crossover music was ballads. It was like, wow. And Janet came along. There's a lot of what you, I think we've been talking about today is kind of the timing of the way things happen. Yeah. When Janet came out, it was at a point in time where pop radio was like, man, we got to get some tempo. 
what's happening over on the black charts? Mm. <laughs> and what was happening on the black charts was, what have you done for me lately? And nasty. Uh, and, and when I think of you and, you know, all of a sudden it was tempo and it was, you know, it was like, oh, well, let's, let's just play. We'll pick a couple records and play those. And we were the beneficiaries, I think, of that, of the timing wow. of that. That's that's interesting because you bring up Luther Vandross. So Luther didn't have a number one, quote, pop hit until Dance With My Father, right? Yep. All this time, mm -hmm. he was always searching for that. And then if we go back early 80s and 81, 82, there's only four songs by Black artists that reached number one. So, right. you know, when we talk about crossover, the, it's kind of like defining, well, what does the middle mean? The middle don't mean what Black music you like. It, it means what this industry says is in the middle. In, in a weird way, it means winning when you're not supposed to because breakthrough albums broke past the ceiling, I guess. You know, it, I mean, that's just always my perspective, you know, when I'm, when I'm listening to all this, uh, when, I'm, when I'm listening to music, when I'm analyzing music and reminding people that, yo, you know Stevie Wonder is pop music, right? You, you know that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know that. Jan Jackson Poppy. Anyway, you know, I, I, I digress. Yeah. But, I, but, but, I, but I'll, I'll tell you something, sorry to you, I'll just say one thing about that. Yeah. When we made the Control album, the album we were making was, we, we lived in a neighborhood in, in LA. We were back in Minneapolis recording at that point in time, but we had just lived in a neighborhood in LA that wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't the nicest neighborhood. It wasn't posh or anything like that. But what it was, was when we would walk up the street in this neighborhood, we would hear music blasting out of people's houses. Mm. And that always told you the barometer of where music was, right? And so when we made the Control album, we were making an album that we wanted to hear blasting out of that neighborhood's houses as we walked up the street. Wow. Okay? So I remember my, you know, kind of our first impression in going back there, I remember walking down the street, and we were here, and what have you done for me lately? Blasting out of everybody's house. Mm. And we kind of looked at each other and said, we did it. Now, we didn't know that all of a sudden the Billboard pop chart, it was going to be a top five because that wasn't what we set out to do. So I just use that as an example. Yeah. That wasn't what we were trying to do. We were trying to make music for the people in that neighborhood that we lived in that resonated with them. Wow. And that, that's what we were trying to do. Wow. And, it, and yeah. it's crazy. And it, it, Go ahead, Terry. I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say just at that time, too, uh, when you talk about crossover, whatever, there's maybe two slots. You had to be one of the chosen ones right. to make that, that right. conversion. Right. Um, I remember having that conversation with Luther about crossover. I mm. mean, that was his, his, his main theme about everything. Right. And I'm like, dude, you're, first of all, like R&B, if you sell gold in R&B at that time, you were huge. Right. But Luther would sell at least seven fifty to a million all the time. So yeah. he already was he already was crossing over. He exactly. just wasn't uh, particularly, I guess, available on the radio stations on the airwaves. Right. But but his his music and his his uh, abilities were crossing over everywhere. Absolutely. So it just it just took a, a lot of time. So we never. I don't think we ever thought about crossing over or anything. It was just it, that's all based on the artist anyway. You know. But my, my thing is, you guys, like I said, change the sound of black music. And I mean, I always look at you guys as as the duo that really kind of started New Jack Swing, you know, even with like Nasty and stuff with that, that sound. And and but at the same time, as as a child of hip hop, I've always looked at you guys as so hip hop. At the same time, you know, like I'm hearing Run DMC in your music. And then when, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then in the early 90s with Jan, I'm here where you, like, you guys have done so much with music that it's difficult to talk about what you did. Because what you did is change the way everybody made music. So it's kind of like, it kind of, it doesn't wash away. It continues. And now it's flowing into your debut album so can you talk to me about this debut album damn near 40 years <laughs> later 
By the way, I, 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 and before we, we talk about that, can I can I just say that the biggest compliment that you've paid us, and you've paid us a lot of them uh, in this interview today, um, is that is our connection with hip hop. Because mm. as I always said to people, I used to DJ. There was many, when, you know, I got the name Jimmy Jam, that was my DJ name. Mm -hmm. Actually a bartender at the club that I DJed at. But I always felt like, um, we always were. We always felt we're not of hip hop, but we love hip hop. We embrace it. We loved it. I played it as a DJ. I remember putting Rapper's Delight on for the very first time, and everybody stopped on the dance floor and turned around and just looked at me because they thought I was rapping. Mm. And I'm like, why is everybody looking at me? Like, what is that? <laughs> but I just, but I just remember then, then, then our hunger was like wow, what else sounds like this? Because everybody kind of said, oh, it's a novelty record. And we were the opposite. We were like, no, 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 no. There's got to be more like this. Like, what else? You know, and I remember Curtis Blow came out, but we were like Treacherous 3, Funky 4 plus one more, you know, Spoonie G. We, we were like into the, the, the real stuff, right? And, yeah. and, and, and so, so for me, I always feel so blessed that hip hop evolved and we have some little sprinkle of seasoning in there somewhere because we're not from New York. We're, that's not our thing. But any of those connections, like we talked about earlier, once again, with, with Kendrick or with um, or even moving forward to, you know, latter day now in the in the what I call the what have you done for me lately um, scenario of her being number one with damage, which is mm -hmm. making love in the rain yes. from us. Absolutely. Those connections, those connections, man, are 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 just absolutely amazing man so i i just want to say that before we go into talking about our album yeah it's just how much we love and respect hip-hop and the people that we've sampled the people that have sampled us and the culture the hip-hop culture mean, we, you we guys love. influenced by james brown lynn collins y'all brought that into oh, janet jackson absolutely. i mean is there any discussion yeah. i mean it's like you got you know it you guys are hip-hop whether you know it or not you're hip-hop you know, because yeah, I, it's I like, love that. That's that's the best compliment I've heard all day. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Say no, that. no. And I was going to say, too, that you, you can't you miss the point if you don't bring people like Sly Stone into this. Who, yeah. All those things that all those things that we are, he was before us. Mm. And mm -hmm. he in, he inspired us, not only us, but Prince. Yes. Yep. You know, and then Gamble and Huff. Yes. Like who takes who takes a. Uh, uh, a mutron and puts it on a bass uh, or uh, a fuzz and puts it on a bass and plays for the love of money. Yeah, yeah. Like, like who, who does that? That's very innovative. So yeah. we were always trying to just push the envelope and just be progressive as we possibly could and embracing all that technology that was at our disposal. So, you know, but Hey man, we had great mentors and visions to look at because live stone, man, you, his songwriting was superb. Yes. You know? His his arrangements were superb. Yes, and the technology that he used, he used synthesizers and real horns, real bass, mm -hmm. but he also used that little click box in there too, the little right. organ farfisa box. Yes, yes, yeah, he used all that same stuff. Yes, you know, and, and nobody ever said that and that it was right. females and empowered yeah, and females. Absolutely. When was the first time you saw a, a you know a female keyboard player, a female uh, you know trumpet player? Um, like all of those things right. and a, a white drummer and like, yeah. you know, it was so just mind blowing just to see that the combination of people he put together, man, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So yeah, we, I mean, yeah. listen, so all what we are is really the product of all of those things and we acknowledge yeah. and respect. That. Yeah. You guys are the product of all those things, but you guys open up a whole new lane for many artists. There is there is no Janet Jackson if it wasn't for y'all. And I, I mean, not you know, she was making good music before y'all, but what you guys did was make Janet Jackson hip hop in a way that was musically a bit more sophisticated, right? And I don't mean that in a condescending way at all. You know, I mean, no, no, I, I, we we don't take it as a condescending thing at all. But the thing, but the thing I would say is the first two albums that Janet did. Um, what she was missing to me on those albums was that attitude. 
Like when you thought about her mm-hmm. as, you know, good the good times days when she was acting or on the variety shows with her brother, it was always this feisty attitude that right. she had. And then when she made the records, which by the way, the, the records she made, the first two albums were really at her dad's insistence right. um, that she sing. Right. She worked with Renee and Angela and she worked with Leon Silvers right. and she worked with Giorgio Moroder. These are all top, top course, producers. Yes, yes, yes. But she also but she also worked with Jesse Johnson. And Jesse Johnson got that little bit of attitude that mm-hmm. we were looking for, right? When he did Fast Girls and that other stuff. And that was when we did Control, we asked her what she wanted to talk about. Or we didn't ask her, we just had conversations with her. Yeah. And then we basically empowered her because when we showed her the lyrics that we had started on Control, she looked at the lyrics and said, oh, wait, this is what we've been talking about. And we said, yeah. And she said, so whatever we talk about, that's what we're going to write about? Yeah. And then she said, oh, I want to write about this. I want to write about this. It was like the light bulb went on. So our smartest thing has always been, I will say, is we've always involved females in what we do um, and listened to them and empowered them to do what they do. And that, to me, has been one of the keys to us doing. And we've allowed them to inspire us in the writing. because. If Janet doesn't have that feisty attitude and that kind of, you know, with Nasty, when we did Nasty, you mentioned Nasty, New Jack Swing. When we did Nasty, when she went in and started singing it, she was like, sitting in the movie show. I'm like, no, 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 no. Sing it like, you know, the other day when you were singing, when you had a cold and you were like, sitting in the movie. I said, sing it like that. And she was like, really? It's like, yeah. And when she trusted us and she sang it like that and you see the results. So. It's a, it's a lot that goes into it, but it's really the people that we, that they make us look good, man. Well, it's not us. It's the people well, that make us look good. She trusted y'all because like you guys are black excellence. I mean, you guys are the, the gamble and huff of the last 40 years. You know, I mean, you've changed the sound and y'all still making hits. I mean, I, I, I listened to the last two singles that y'all got um, on this upcoming album. And I'm just tripping that you guys, you guys have this longevity. Y'all hot. Y'all ain't warm. Y'all try to stay warm, but y'all <laughs> hot though. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and, and 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 I hear as a producer, I hear the music behind the music, and I hear what you're telling the artists to do. Or let me rephrase: I hear how you're making them comfortable and being vulnerable. I mean, just even like Mar- Mariah, like hearing her on her, on her track, and then. Hearing babyface just being babyface. It's people like you that allow musicians to to be their best, you know. So I want to make sure y'all get y'all flowers, and I just want to reiterate how much we are indebted to your artistry, you know. Man, that's that's so nice, man. I, I'll tell you, for for us, really, it, it is about the artists for us. Always has been. Um, I, I will tell you real quickly that Babyface was interesting because Babyface allowed us, first of all, to um, to produce him, you know, and we realized that, you know, we knew that was a big deal anyway, but we realized that when after we were done with the song, totally done, and we played it for him, and I remember the first time he heard it, he just said, wow, that sounds really good. And we said, oh, thanks. And he goes, no, that sounds really good. Wow. We're like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, no, 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 that sounds really good. We said, man, motherfucker, <laughs> your baby face. What, what do you think it's going to sound like? But then it, it dawned on us that as a producer who does his own records, when he's listening to himself mm. sing, he's listening for the mistakes. Mm. He's thinking about how can I do this better, this guitar part, this mm. chord change, this whatever. That's what he's thinking about. But when somebody hears it just outside of themselves, right. Um, they just enjoy it. They go, exactly. oh yeah, that sounds really good. That was the way he was able to hear the songs. And really all the artists on the songs were able to hear themselves like that. Wow. Um, and, and it was really cool. Even Mariah was very much the same way. She sent us the song. She, we sent her a different song. She sent that song back. Mm. And then she said, it was just piano and a kind of acapella vocal. Mm. And she was like, what do you think of this? And we said, okay, cool. So we hooked the track up. We did everything. We sent it back to her. She said, Oh my God, I got to resing this now because now you guys about to put a beat on it. I didn't know, I didn't hear it like this. And it was like, okay, cool. Wow. So the, it made the artist excited. And that's been the coolest thing about this is it, it's making the artist fall back in love with themselves. Yes. <laughs> which is just like as a fan, you're going to fall back in love with that artist. Yeah. But it should be when you say Babyface, what song would you want to hear if it was a new Babyface song? Hopefully that's the song we made. Same with Mariah. Same with Mary J, same with, you know, everybody, uh, Boys to Men, everybody on the album. 
that's the feeling we want you to get. We call it nostalgia, by the way. Wow. It's that excitement of hearing something new, that discovery, that moment of discovery of hearing something new, but that feeling of comfort and warmness and familiarity of something trusted and true. So that's the combination we're going for. You mean like when Michael heard Janet's vocals uh, on, was that, uh, I forget what it was on. I forget what song it was. Yeah, on Scream. And he was like, where do y'all record this? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know? Oh, yep. that's, that's, yep. that's beautiful, man. But, you know, your your humility coupled with your extraordinary, extraordinary abilities not only inspires me, but so many around the world, you know? Your, your music is played by millions of people every day. You know, you're touching the, the hearts and souls of people around the world. Your story is so important to me. Because all we got to do is help people believe in themselves, you know, and, and mm -hmm. as arbiters of their own career, you know, you both are proof that we can all be proprietor pr proprietors on a galactic level. You know, you are proof that the music never stops as you have a dope new album coming out. You know what I'm saying? So I want to thank you guys for spending your time with me. And I want to thank you guys for helping me become who I am today. Hey, this is Jimmy Jam. And Terry Lewis. And you're listening to... Invisible Blackness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>